Hello and welcome to another episode of the um, podcast, uh, Future of Transport. Um, I'm your host, Sam Tian, um, and I have the very, um, well, very big pleasure today of uh, inviting Jackie Murray, um, CEO of National Manufacturing Institute Scotland um, and Deputy, Deputy Director of Far the Faraday Battery Challenge onto the podcast. How are you doing, Jackie? Uh, I'm very well, but I don't do both of those things. I was I was the deputy director of the Faraday Battery Challenge. Apologies. Now apologies. the chief operating officer of the National <laughs> Manufacturing Institute Scotland. So no, I'm delighted to be here. I'm really well. Thank you. Fantastic. And um, yeah, Jack, I, j just just before we sort of get into it today, I, I don't suppose you want to sort of introduce yourself, sort of a bit about your journey in in this sort of renewable space from sort of A to B, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I guess um, it's been a long journey, right? So I'm getting old these days. <laughs> So I did 10 years on the steelworks, actually, as a metallurgist. So I'm a, a manufacturing and materials engineer by background. Um, and actually, I ended up wanting to go more towards the environmental side. And I started working um, for the Environment Agency. And I ended up very deeply in the, in the legal side of environmental regulation. So I had the pleasure of doing some really exciting things, like transposing the Industrial Emissions Directive, leading a team that were re-permitting Port Talbot in line with that IED um, and leading up an infringement case around a Welsh power station at one point uh, with the European Commission. So I've had a very exciting career in environmental. Um, and then about seven years ago, um, I had the opportunity to move to Innovate UK and take on innovation, which fitted really well with my background being an ex-works technical and, and, and sort of uh, specialist engineering person. Um, and ended up in the in the Faraday Battery Challenge. And I think for me, there's something in all of those changes that that is lucky because I had depth, but also um, I ended up becoming a bit of a program manager, a bit of a fixer, I think, <laughs> along the way. So it was great to head up Faraday. It was a brilliant program for the government um, to sort of take on, and it's still thriving. So I left just as we uh, just before we got the final announcement that uh, it was being extended for another three years and another two hundred eleven million. So yeah, really good, very lucky career, really. Yeah, no, but you've got a very exciting uh, LinkedIn profile, which I've, I've sort of spent a little bit of time <laughs> going through and, and pulling a few bits out. But um, just, just for the listeners who may not be or aware of the the um, Faraday Battery Challenge or what that means and what that, that does. Could you just sort of explain a little bit about that, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. So it's it, these things always sound much more complicated than they are, um, and yet they are exceptionally com complicated. So uh, the reality is it was um, a fund from government to get UK clever people from universities to uh, sort of companies to really get the right stuff to happen for batteries for the UK, particularly in manufacturing and particularly to encourage foreign direct investment into the UK. So it really funded the Faraday Institution, which I think now has got somewhere around 500 plus researchers in battery technology in, across a whole raft of our universities here now. So we've got a real strength um, in the research element. Then there was about 100 million more that's been spent on collaborative R&D projects, getting companies together on the riskier um, sort of innovation. And so innovations can be anything like new ideas, new new products, new um, sort of business models, but they're risky if government's going to fund them. They're not stuff people would naturally do or get funding for. So if you join in consortia and get some match funding, you can really see some leap forwards in the tech uh, that way. And that, that's what the central sort of element of Faraday was. And then the final element was the, the really amazing sort of £150 million pound plus industrial um, UK industrialization battery. Industrialization Centre. I'll get that right, UK BIC, as I tend to call it, hence the reason I can't expand it, um, which is a plant um, really designed to pilot new technologies through from different chemistries, from different formats, um, and also look at how you process them to get the consistency and the quality that you need to go into automotive or any sort of propulsion battery. So it was a huge program where we were sort of project program leading leaders for that uh, and being the funding and working with the government uh, and innovate uk and uk right no fantastic and i think today obviously I think when we were speaking previously i think the majority of your work now very much is around net zero decarbonization um just going to throw a very broad question out to, to the floor here but what does that look like 
Yeah, it's a, it's a big thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I think the world is full of complexity uh, this century. I think we're we're simple answers are, are being shown not to be particularly <laughs> useful at this moment in history. Right? We have to think think differently. So the route to net zero. I mean, net zero is a word. It's a couple of words, right? What does it mm. mean? The, the, it, what it really means, I think, is that we have to really plan a, a, a way to get to um, a CO2 equivalent emissions world that means that we aren't going to destroy ourselves with really violent climate change. And I think that's, you know, you're sort of seeing it now. I think we've got about seven years to try and hit a 1.5 degree change. And what's for me, what's important about net zero, if we use that term, is breaking it down so so we all know what we can do. Mm. And I don't mean, um, you know, the small things, the lifestyle things we can do individually. What I mean is how do we make steel differently? How do we trans how do we catch transport differently? How do we work differently? You know, we're I don't know where you're sat today, Sam, but I'm here in South Wales, uh, working for a Scottish organization, you know. It's how do we do things differently so that we can really have a, a future for our children and grandchildren and, and moving forward that actually is um you know a good planet to live on right mm. so it's that overarching game but it's broken down into the specialisms that we need to really think about um and i think the communication of it gets lost because um, i learned a new term actually last week which was eco distress uh, and that actually teenagers in particular uh, but people are getting themselves very very depressed thinking about the future right um mm. and i kind of was trying to talk to some students about it and i said well it's a bit like trying to climb a really really massive mountain you need to specialize right you know uh, it, it's not just about working together it's about specialists working together so specialize yeah. do what you love but really focus on climate change as part of that whether it's an archaeologist or an engineer or a campaigner or whatever right do what you love um mm. and get into that detail but then work together and and that's sort of the the space where at least we can move forward so when we talk about net zero for me some of the ways it's been broken down by the climate change commission for example into different sectors is really helpful so mm. we know that transport's a big stubborn area of co2 emissions we thought it was getting better but actually what happened was we made cars more efficient and, and the, the CO2 emissions per kilometre dropped. Uh, we just started driving more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we have these challenges and we know there's no silver bullet, right? And, and I think a lot of the narrative you see around net zero is it's just searching for that silver bullet. And I think in this century, we don't have one. We've got to have multiple solutions, people working together, trying to work out what the best solution is for mm. different uses different things so it's a hell of a challenge sam but it's an exciting one right no, yeah and, and a very current one as well because i think with the time of recording today you know i think last week we had rec records broken globally for um highest average temperature in, in a day ever so yeah. very very current topic and, and one that i think a lot of people i speak to are on that same journey trying to do their bit um especially here in, in sort of uk and europe as well in the us um obviously you've got to find that silver bullet for for the world yeah yeah and that's that's the that's the exciting bit is it's it's sort of we've got to re-engineer the world because it's on every level in every mm. different you know application we can't say no no net zero um is is higher than people not having jobs or starving or mm. things like that so we have to work ways forward um and that does mean quite often a more holistic approach a more systems based approach but it's not losing specialism so mm. um you know just for, just the data for climate change right you need really specialist knowledge to understand it yeah um, and and it's been the irony is it's been predicted for years and years and and those models have been refined and refined and yet it's still changing so you know we we need to specialize and and understand and go towards it rather than get paralyzed by it which is more of a worry yeah, absolutely. I, I think the the previous sort of um, carbon budget breaks down sort of different steps quite nicely in terms of what we can do. Um, I pulled up a couple of points. So adopting low carbon solutions, so what we drive, how we travel, as you mentioned earlier, you know, expansion and low carbon energy supplies, um, very much in the utilities and energy sector and reducing yeah. sort of demand for carbon extensive activities. But I mean, 
could you elaborate on sort of what that means, how that looks, sort of what other things could we be doing, you know, in our daily lives? So I guess I can do it from manufacturing and a transport. Yes. Thing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's my specialism. We're talking about it. I can't, I can't do it for everything. Um, I think there's certainly something around how we manufacture products. Mm. It's really important. So one of the things we're getting better at um, is more data, right? Handling bigger and bigger data. Um, what we also need to make sure is we have robust data, but that's a whole different engineering geekiness. So actually what we need is we need to make sure we're not greenwashing by accident or on purpose. So we have to be really, really, really mindful on what happens at end of life. How do we how do we turn things around? How do we how do we have um a low low carbon product that we can be comfortable in as being the right option? So when we look at electric vehicles, this is a really good case point, right? So it takes a bit more energy and co2 therefore to to make a battery full electric vehicle right it takes a bit more than internal combustion mm. and there's a few reasons for this right and the reasons are that the volume and the and the and the high energy intensity of the materials that are going into the battery one and two we haven't had 120 years of trying to down cost those vehicles mm. we've had a few right uh, and so what you're seeing now is you're seeing how uh, how battery electric vehicles can start to really improve the technology, but also improve the technology throughout the supply chain and end of life at recycling and things like that. And as we're doing that, we're sort of starting to see just how good they could be as an interim solution uh, for some applications. This mm. is this is the complexity bit, right? It's not either or. There's no black and white, right? Um, what's really interesting about it, I guess, the best data that I've seen will be the Ricardo report. Um, and that sort of looks at, you know, you, you have a slight increase in manufacturing intensity uh, from a climate change perspective. But by the end of um, their lives, you know, an internal combustion engine is three times more in most European com countries uh, th than an internal combustion engine, right? And mm. we can see that that you know that that three times more becoming five times ten times more and because as those supply chains become more efficient as we really do sort out end of life um, and getting material flow back around and not having to mine as much all of those things start to add together mm. and the technology development really helps that as well um, and as we're looking so tightly it's really fun though because that you know people always go on about um there's a lot of sort of scrutiny of evs not being the answer mm. and as somebody who's worked for the civil service great because <laughs> actually the more you scrutinize that stuff um it means that they have to stay honest right mm. so the regulations that come through to double check actually how things are being mined and transported and supply chains are working all of that starts to become bang on so you can see that's just for electric vehicles and it's hugely complex and mm -hmm. we need to change that for how you make steel, how you make plastics or, you know, how do you replace pr plastics? How do we um, change a lot of oil and gas based products um, away from being solely oil and gas? Mm. How do we minimise that so that actually we can bring some other measures in to sort of compensate for any oil and gas based products we really do need? So there's there's this whole complexity of it um, that's really, really important for hitting a, a 1.5 degree target. How do we get everybody's house insulated? You know, some of those big questions that we haven't managed to achieve, right? Mm. Which, which actually some of they are some of the more simple ones, right? How do we get solar panels on everybody's roofs uh, that are really efficient and can actually take down bills as well as allowing us to live more sustainably? Those questions, they're the ones. Mm, absolutely. And um, you mentioned something, um, I think, around, you know, recycling, how we look at sort of materials and things like that. I think a piece of your work um, previously was very much working with battery or uh, battery manufacturers in terms of that sort of recycling piece. And this is a topic I quite talk, like talking about as well. But mm, sure. do you, could you share some insight into where we are um, with that sort of technology? Yeah, so it's really interesting because I'm out of people that tell me, you know, batteries can't be recycled. Um, and it, <laughs> that that's a classic sort of oversimplification of a, of a complex thing, right? So it's difficult to recycle lithium, but lithium is relatively abundant. We just mm. don't really look for it because we didn't have many applications for it, right? 
So it's a relatively abundant element, uh, but it acts and behaves. You'll remember in science when your teacher dropped it into a bowl of water and it, it fizzed and popped. It acts much more like a chemical than it does a transition metal like iron or nickel or cobalt, right? Mm. So uh, it's a real challenge to recycle. But there are ways to do that, right? So there's research going on using hydrometallurgy. So if you want a sexy bit of career advice, hydrometallurgists are a very, very rare skill and a very steeply um, increasing skill globally because of things like recycling batteries. Also, the mining industry switching away from some things like coal and switching towards and onto energy metals. Actually, again, hydromet applications to get really efficient extraction, massively important. So like when you look at the recycling of lithium, it's hard. But in a 600 kilo Tesla battery, you're looking at about eight kilos of lithium. Mm-hmm. So it's still an intense chemical uh, you know, element, and it's one we will want to catch back through hydro. But you can recycle your batteries now. In fact, they are recycled because they've been banned since 2009 to go to, li- to landfill, mm-hmm. um, all batteries, including lithium ion. So, and that's in the UK and across all of Europe, right? So we know we need to get these back. What we don't yet have in the UK is the ability to do the full hydromet background, but there's research going on. But you can shred them to black mass, mm. and black mass can be traded and, and, and moved around. The challenge really is it's much more complicated as a system than the answers people want to hear. Mm. So the, the, the base answer is that none of it's going to landfill. Uh, and there's batteries all over the place, you know, which are full of expensive materials that people want to get back. So unlike recycling cardboard, for example, which has got a low value, you're trying to set up a system to recycle something that's got an expense, you know, a real cost associated with it. So mm-hmm. it's a really exciting moment because it will go. And you also have a huge waste industry. So you have the likes of European metal recyclers, sewers, Biffa, Verido, Veolia, whoever picks up your your waste now, right? These guys are not lightweights in, in understanding how to make money out of batteries. So there's there's those guys. The trick as well is to move it away from seeing it as a waste industry and the car companies and material companies are starting to drive forward. The reason I, I, I joined Glencore and British Vault um, to see whether we could get a, a joint venture up off the ground in battery recycling, uh, that was really because a big materials company like, like Glencore has the scale to actually be able to make money at mm. every point of the journey from where we are now to a hydro met refinery, right? And really getting back all the lithium and really mm. efficient high-end recycling, right? So it's companies like Glencore, it's companies like um, North Hydro, it's the co- big companies in the material space and the metal space that are really exciting right now, definitely ones to watch. Getting back copper, aluminium, cobalt, nickel, those metals, much easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can do it now using different techniques, electro winning, uh, pyrometallurgical techniques, for example, probably the old school way. And they're all very effective. It's just some take more energy and CO2 than others, right? So like mm. a blast furnace on a steelworks, you're using carbon as a reductant and therefore emitting CO2 at the end of the process. So there's just all this really complex system to tease out at every stage with specialists yeah. working together. Um, but it's changing pretty rapidly. And I think that's where you also have regulatory interventions that are coming. And that, for me, is really important. So things like changes to the the law around whether you can put your lithium-ion batteries from your hoover, which is at the end of life, into the normal waste bin, or whether or not they go and are collected and recorded and have data on them, that's much clearer. Mm. Those type of regulatory drivers are really important for actually segregating out those types of batteries and enabling more mass. The problem with battery recycling is we don't have we don't have the stockpiles of them we don't have huge great mountains of them they're Mm. predicted to come but we don't have it now and if i want to make money out of it and i want to make a business um however what's the word i'm looking for however charitably however much i I want to do it at cost or not for profit right um i still need a lot of tons a year 
and yeah. and that's again the other piece of the challenge is dismantling them renewing them you know remanufacturing them all of those things are also coming so your scrap dealer at the moment takes your end of life internal combustion engine right uh it splits it up into components for reuse or for recycling and you, you're going to get service centers that will be repairing and focused on evs and those big mm. batteries um but you'll also get them working to dismantle but i think also the car companies will step into a lot of this yeah i think uh, you can definitely see in the work that i do i can see a lot of them doing that now um you know i think vw being one of the big ones with their power co um, exactly project and you can see and the, the bit that people i think is hard for people to get their heads around on the technology but if i can take aluminium out of a, out of an ore at a very low concentration uh, and you hand me a battery and i've got all the mining knowledge and the materials knowledge then there's definitely some solutions right yeah for getting copper out for getting alley out nickel is much bigger proportion normally in, in those cobalt you know these are expensive metals that with a high price that you can get out of good quality using current existing recycling technology. So, mm. so there's there's ways forward. But what you tend to hear in the press is, oh, there's no recycling of lithium. Uh, and you're kind of going, that's coming, but it's a very small proportion. Uh, so, so you know, watch the space. And it should be recycled. Don't get me get me wrong. I'm not advocating you don't. I'm just saying it's, it's all being re-engineered right now. Yeah, absolutely, and and the the battery recycling piece is still very much in its infancy, really. As is as is the battery uh, industry or, or the e mobility industry, sort of as a as a whole, really. I think we haven't quite hit a, a, a running pace in the second second hand market or second life market yet. We're still sort of very much first life, and in the next few years. Yeah, it's what I do find really interesting is. You know, is it fuel cell? Is it is it is it battery? Is it what are we going to do if China's doing nothing? Well, if you look at the sales this year of electric vehicles, it's about sixteen percent of the overall market. When I started mm. in the UK, it was like something one point two. Now globally, that sixteen percent bulk of it's coming from China. Mm. So, if the world's biggest economy is the world's bigger biggest mover and shaker on uh, electric vehicles, then actually all our automotive industry, for example, in Europe that we're used to, has got to really, really invest now. Because um, you're talking about, you know, the, the the ability, so it's funny, if manufacturing engineering, whether it's automotive manufacturing or anything else, big part of your work is to make it more and more cost effective. Mm. Your cost engineering all the way through, right? How do you save that minuscule amount? And the interesting about thing about that is very often cost and carbon can be sort of correlated. So it's a bit different on a steelworks where you've got a, a CO2 reaction going on as part of the process. But even there, you know, if you have to generate electricity, there tends to be a link between efficiency and carbon mm. efficiency. So again, you know, we're just developing this all around. It's all starting to come through. Yeah, and, and I think that's quite an interesting point in terms of sort of the China and, and, and the West as well. I mean, uh, if you look at sort of the UK as a standalone um, sort of nation that we are, I mean, in terms of manufacturing, is the future for us increasing manufacturing? Obviously, we've got JLR potentially bringing their sort of battery manufacturing plant to the UK. Obviously, British Vault was um, and, and still is um, having been bought out by an Australian company, um, you know, still going and, and producing um, and manufacturing batteries in the UK. But can we be doing more in this space to to tackle um, well, Chinese Chinese influence and, and benefit the manufacturing prowess of the UK? I think it's tricky, uh, not just because you know China is so dominant in the space and South mm. Korea and and other and also the Americans. Um, and also the fact that Europe are really investing heavily now. Mm. Um, but I think it's doable. But you, again, you know, it's this, it's, there's no silver bullet, right? Um, a, a, a Jaguar Land Rover Tata Gigafactory in the southwest would be amazing. Right? That's a great mm. way to anchor, start to anchor supply chains. People can start to see who you can supply that can supply that Gigafactory and how recycling at the end of life can come back around and through, right? So you can start to get much more um, tie up. But there's also opportunities in different, you know, it, it, batteries and lithium-ion batteries 
and all you know um sort of high powered ba uh, recy um, rechargeable batteries like that have so many applications from static storage you know if i've got a plant um and it's it's four o'clock on a december evening or a january evening right um rather than switch my plant off and lose productivity actually i can leave it on and just just run the battery run it run it off a battery right i mean it's it sounds crazy when i think of you know big automotive companies or steelworks that used to take load shedding for example or still do right um but you could you can actually make some really important strides in that to things like microgrids um you know replacing diesel gen sets on construction sites across london uh you'd have a big impact for example on on not just co2 for buildings but also really big impact on on local air quality you know if you've got if you've ever lived next to a building site you'll know what it's like to live next to a building site yeah and some of it's just the dust but some of it's actually from the diesel gen sets right so there's there's other ways to do it we can look at things like military applications some really high-end niche mm. we have a phenomenal motorsport industry in the uk i can say that after the british yes. one Prix <laughs> yesterday um and actually that's a 1.6 liter engine with a battery next to it yeah so when you think about Ayrton senna's 4.5 liter monster engines or nigel mansell's back in the day you know these are the change in that technology is really cutting edge mm. and motorsport probably is the best engineering sort of examples at the moment but we we need to really drive through on those niche elements as well we yeah. have more niche labels as well you know like from aston martin and bentley and and rolls royce i was looking at the looking and chuckling to myself at the new rolls royce elect full electric rolls royce that's just just launched yeah. So if you've got a spare three hundred and thirty mil <laughs> thirty grand or whatever, <laughs> you decide you want to live in a Rolls Royce rather than a house, whichever yeah. you you know, whatever you but it's that fact that they're starting to really understand the technology because trying to move a two point nine ton Rolls Royce with batteries tells you a lot about the type of technologies that have been developed to get there. Yeah, absolutely. That needs a bit of grunt. And um, if I'm right, Aston Martin, I think recently um, disclosed that they were transitioning all their all their um, car models to to electrics now. So it's. Uh... I think the car companies have worked out that. I think all car companies have worked out that the targets that they will be set are absolutely going to transform their business. Build their their their. Um, the way they do business right yeah. so faraday got set up because actually the car companies in the uk get together in the auto council and they worked out that there was just no way they could meet what climate change was going to demand for transport i.e., what they could predict for the emission limits mm. for their fleets across europe there was no way they were going to meet it if they stayed on their their hybridization and eventually getting to a full electric in you mm. know 20 years time or whatever it was they had to move faster and that's just what people have realized need to catch up and then when you look at other sectors so we're talking transport now so um aerospace you know chatting to senior people from boeing i you know sort of saying well there's no way aerospace is not going to have targets so mm. by 2035, we need a clear long haul solution that's as near as down to zero. <laughs> right. And that's a real challenge. And that probably yeah. involves synthetic fuels, batteries, fuel cells, <laughs> anything you can throw at it, right? I know. I, so I it's think... going to be really interesting to watch the aerospace do that. And, and, I, and I'd also expect regulation on it, right? So you can see how those things have to be done collectively and regulated mm. collectively shipping's the same you cannot continue so most shipping big shipping companies have said they'll be net zero by 2050 most mm. mining companies have said the same and you're then starting to see some transition um, and it's interesting that things like mining um, as an industry is moving faster than others i don't know if you knew that so electric tonka trucks you know these huge great mining trucks used to... oh, the big one yeah yeah, so there's there's full electric versions of those, and th there's reasons for that. There's reasons because of the way they get used. Um, you can recharge or you can swap batteries. So I think Sandvik have a mining equipment business that will swap your batteries every two hours, and they'll yeah. they'll sell you the vehicles, but basically be the service provider for the batteries. So you can see how 
that makes that takes away all your emissions in deep mining for example from those types of vehicles mm. uh, that means you'd have to dig less holes for ventilation shafts which deserves less ecology which actually increases your likelihood of getting a permit so mm. there's all these things that, that that are going on so it's really interesting to sort of look at how the technology is developing so if you've got a mine for example where uh, there's a long, slow slope which mm. your, your Tonka trucks are holding heavy weights in. Then actually, you can use a refer, reverb uh, for the bait braking systems and recharge a huge amount of that battery as it's going down that slope. And mm. they're controlled environments where you can calculate it. Unlike you and I, you know, bombing around in our in our cars locally, that's a harder calculation to work out how mm. that would work, right? So you can see different industries moving. Um, and shipping would be the one I start to, expect to start to see because um, because they've never really had targets on things like air quality, uh, but there are now platforms that regulate mm. things like high sulfur fuels in, in shipping. So it's coming on every level. Yeah, and, and, and I guess I've got the last couple of questions for yourself, Jackie, but um, obviously you mentioned 2050 there for a couple of these industries. I mean, is that, in terms of time scale, is that is that enough is that too late or do we need to be moving that yeah we forward? talked about this before didn't we you know who's going to pay for it and is it fast enough oh there was a moment probably about five years ago where someone came up to me and was telling me that that the the whole transition was too fast that there's no way you weren't going to put companies out of business with a transition and and he asked me you know what the hell was government thinking and what evidence was government actually even considering mm. and uh I remember sort of looking at him and thinking, this is a great question. And then thinking, well, and as I said to him, so the evidence they're using is climate change evidence. So you've got a tension here between what is doable from a commercial financial mm -hmm. capitalist model for big businesses and small businesses alike versus what climate change is actually demanding. So what do I think? So I think I'm old enough now just turn 50 um, but i'm old enough now to remember things like there being a backlash against climate change the first time around where the likes of david bellamy and terry wogan were like no it's you know we're really anti it being a thing um and then Chicksbury flooded and those huge southwest floods and i think Hull flooded about the same time as well and people suddenly saw summer flooding that they'd never seen before mm. on the scale they'd never seen before. And all of a sudden, the amount of people that believed in climate change was real suddenly changed overnight. Mm. So I would argue that if you ran an automotive business uh, in internal combustion engines and you were living in northern Italy where the floods were recently, yeah. you'd have a very different belief system. So the sad thing is, I think it's not fast enough. Um, it may put people out of business. Whether we can achieve it is the challenge. Um, but I think climate change will, for the next 10 years, uh, you know, really make its presence felt to everybody. And it will yeah. affect you or your family or your friends at some point in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can't predict what it is and I can't predict where it is. Um, uh, and that sounds very negative. But I think just think it's a, a thing we've got to get used to. Mm. You know, um, in fact, I was sort of reflecting on the the, the news thing saying we're no lot we're now in the entering the Anthropocene age. You know, this is an age of climate mm. uh, change and difference. And actually, we just have to embrace that and move that forward, right? Um, but it does mean change. We cannot just assume what we've learnt previously is still right, mm. and we have to work together. So we need a very different m mindset from. You know, we try and find somebody who's got that silver bullet who tells us the answer. You're going to be wrong on big projects um, and you're going to need to stay responsive and bring as many people close. If there was ever an argument between um, protecting IP and getting to market as fast as you possibly can, I think climate change is going to, is going to be the one that shows that you better get to market uh, and you better do that any which way and as collaboratively as you can because you know the planet's going to need it and we're going to need it. yeah absolutely and and I, I, just uh, last question just sort of takes a, a little bit out of the doom and gloom but um what are, yeah. what are the things that you're seeing at the moment that you know you're you're really proud of or you know you're you're you think you know what we're doing that really really well 
Oh, that is a question. I think, I think there's a sense of change now. I think that's the thing we're looking at. It's that realisation that we can work differently. So you're starting to see big industries like steel talk really seriously about whole scale change, you know, moving away from a blast furnace to an electric car, uh, huge scale, you know, battery factories, for example, and mid scale battery factories as well. So you're starting to see, I think, that realisation that that we're letting go of what was and moving towards where we're going. So for me, that's the piece. So I hope I'm right in that. I hope I'm right that, you know, the industries have started to let go of what was holding them back from making those changes, started to really get their heads into those business cases or those those planning stages and are moving forward. And I think that's mm -hmm. the piece. And it's not just being dri driven by, you know, by regulations coming down from above. It's also being driven by consumers uh, and from car companies and from aeroplanes, you know, the people are talking, I talk to are the, you know, those are those companies, right? And they're talking very seriously about it. Mm -hmm. They're making huge commitments to not doing the wrong thing. And it's not because they've suddenly seen the light, right? It's because climate change is now at a scale that actually it's the only game in town for being successful in the long term. Yeah. No. Fantastic. So you well, are, you know, and if you want to try and greenwash, um, either consciously or unconsciously beware because it will catch you i think that's possibly the other the other piece and i think that's really exciting and mm. it and it still, still seems a bit negative and i'm not a negative person <laughs> but there but there is something about that honesty and doing the right thing the right yeah. way it, it's it's here and now more than ever yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, not not negative. I think it's just a serious topic. I think it's something that we take seriously now. And, you know, I think like you said earlier, it will affect not just us, but children, grandchildren and, um, you know, it will long into the future. But I've um, got one eye on the time, Jackie, and I, I think I will wrap up there. Um, but I just want to say thank you very, very much for your time. I know you've uh, got a busy schedule, but really appreciate you on the podcast today. That's OK. That's OK. Um, actually, just just one last thing. I mean, I've moved into the world of the catapults and that for me, that's the space, right? That's the space where you're looking at innovation and how can you do innovation in a, in a, in a way that keeps you, you know, really constructively balancing the books and bringing in much more exciting technologies much faster. Mm. So that's the piece for me. It's I think we're really starting to grasp it and drive it forward. And I'm, you know, I'm delighted to be up at NMIS at the moment. Um, I still seem to talk about battery recycling <laughs> almost every other day. So um, yeah, it's been delightful to be here. I really enjoyed it. Like, like, thanks a lot, Gypsum. My pleasure. Thanks for your time, Jackie. Take care. Cheers.